good to see uh, so many of your names in the long list of people that are attending today. Um, we are excited to welcome you to today's edition to the Main Street Iowa Wednesday at One webinar series. Uh, we hope that today's conversation will help motivate, energize, and set the stage for enhanced storytelling efforts in our Main Street network, not only for 2021, uh, for, the, for the 2021 Main Street Iowa Awards story submission process, but also help to build an ethic of storytelling in all of our programs. Uh, we are excited to welcome Michael Moraine to lead today's conversation. Michael is a former Des Moines Register uh, reporter who now manages communications for the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. And he's going to share some tips to better tell stories, um, some essential skills for communicating the value of the Main Street program. We hope that all ties together, like I said, not only for uh, today's conversations in the framework of the Main Street Iowa Awards activities um, that are going to have that focus on storytelling, um, but we hope that today's conversation will help identify, craft, and share your community stories um, um, from now and into the future of, of how you're promoting not only your Main Street program, um, but also your Main Street um, uh, community. So without any further ado, Michael, I will turn the floor over to you and I will start to share uh, your screen as as you do uh, any sort of introduction that you want to do beyond what I just had. So. Great. Thank you, Michael. You can hear me OK? Yeah. All right. Excellent. It's good to see some of your faces and I know there are others um, online tuning in. So thank you for the invitation to speak to your group. Um, uh, as Michael mentioned, I work for the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, which is sort of a sibling organization of IEDA, which um, oversees the Main Street program. So I, in state government, we are probably cousins. I don't know what the family tree is, um, but I from my perch at the Department of Cultural Affairs, I get to see a lot of the projects that you all are working on. And I just, um, I am so impressed by so many of you who are taking the lead in communities across the state to really um, um, make the most of your spot, your dot on the map, um, and show people why that dot on the map is unlike any other. So thank you for your good work. Uh, and I want to help you just unpack some of the stories that you are sitting on. I know you are sitting on great stories and you want to share them with a wider audience and really um, in a really compelling way. So we will get um, we'll kind of I'll lead you through a couple steps that I have found useful um, uh, both at the Des Moines Register and with my work at Department of Cultural Affairs. And I think if we were all in the same room, I would encourage you to raise your hands and ask questions. But because this is 2021 and all things are up in the air with digital, jot down your questions um, and we will save some time at the end for questions. So um, remember them um, and at the end we will fold them into a discussion uh, like that. So. Um, here we go. Um, and I just first off, thank you, Michael Wagner Wagler for um, he's my lovely assistant who is queuing through the slides so I can just talk and not worry about it. So let's go to the first the next slide right here. All right, <clears throat> just from the get go, um, I wanted to start with this quote from James Polk. He wrote this in his journal at the end of the day on December 28th, 1846. I imagine him in his bedroom in the White House um, with a quill pen and his daily journal as president. And he wrote on this day, nothing much happened today. For the A students out there, you may recognize that December 28th, 1846 is the day that President Polk signed the bill that admitted Iowa into the Union to become the 29th state. So it was not an auspicious start for Iowa storytelling. Um, <laughs> James Polk may not have been very excited about it, but I beg to differ. And 175 years later, um, we all know that he was terribly, terribly wrong. Something big happened on December 28th, 1846, and we have proof. Um, we have 175 years of great stories and great history in the years since. I bring this up for a few reasons. One, to um, offer evidence that nobody else is going to tell our stories. In Iowa and in our small towns, we know they are exciting and we know that there's cool stuff, but the outside world does not. So um, it's, up to it's up to us to tell our own stories. Um, and really, um, 
I'll just give a quick plug. The Department of Cultural Affairs is unrolling a year's worth of programs to celebrate the 175th anniversary um, leading up to December 28th, 2021 this year. Um, so if you have ideas to celebrate your town's history and celebrate Iowa history, we are all ears and we have lots of ideas to help you tell that story. So um, it's a big year, 175th anniversary. But I also bring up this point um, I also bring up James Polk's quote um, because I think it's important to take a step back sometimes and take the long view. So let's go to the next slide. When we are um, when we are telling stories, especially if you are in the thick of it, if you work um, for Main Street or you work with the Chamber of Commerce or the City Council or um, on a volunteer economic development committee, you are in the thick of it. You are making the sausage of community um, community building and strengthening communities. So you are in the work, you see it incrementally. So you, you trade emails and you're on meetings and you see the day-to-day -day stuff of it. So sometimes it's easy to forget that what you are doing makes a difference in the long run. So when you're telling a story, I would encourage you to think about how today looks different than it did in the past and how today looks different than it might look in the future for your town. Sometimes there are physical clues to this. Um, um, one, I, I went to Graceland University in Lamoni and one time for homecoming there was a 5k or a 10k run and it was very informal and the guy who was leading it, we were all kind of lined up at the starting line and the guy who was leading it all of the directions he gave for the route were things that you could only know if you had lived in town for a long time. So it was turn left at what used to be the Smith House, go straight past what used to be um, the High V, turn left at what used to be the Olson's barn. Things that, you know, if you just arrived for that race, you wouldn't you wouldn't know where to run at all. But over time, things change. And so when you are telling your town's story, think about that. And so if you kind of set the dial on the time machine, sometimes it helps to have a little perspective, um, especially especially when you are in the thick of it and you are dealing with to-do lists and, and breakout tasks and all of the nitty gritty bits. Um, in terms of a story, sometimes it helps to take a step back or forward. So let's move on to the next slide. Here is how um, news people recognize what is news and what is not news. Um, I would say that of all the slides you might see during this presentation, this one may be the most useful. Um, this diagram or something like it um, appears in every single journalism 101 book in any journalism class. Um, editors, uh, news editors and news producers may not talk about these terms, they may not use these exact words, but anybody who's in the news business, after a while, they start to um, they start to instinctively have a sense for these different news values, um, the variables that make that can make a story really newsy or make it not so interesting. So these are the things um, when I worked at the register, the editors had a meeting in the morning to plot out the day's news and then they had a mid afternoon meeting to see if their morning plan had changed. Um, and these are the things that helped decide what story went on the front page above the fold and what story kind of got buried, you know, on page 11 um, over by the obituaries. So these are the things that, that can really elevate a story and make it really compelling. Um, or if if a story is sort of lacking any of these, um, then maybe it's not, maybe it might be interesting to one or two people, but it might not have broad impact for the general public. Most of these are self-explanatory, but I want to take us through an example of how, how you can use and use these factors and think about these factors in a way to punch up the newsiness of what it, whatever it is you're talking about. If it's a community project, if you have um, uh, 
rehabbed a building or installed a streetscape or maybe you've planned a community festival, there are ways that you can uh, emphasize or focus on some of these variables in a way that makes um, makes the news more attractive and, and um, irresistible to not only news folks, but also the, the general public. So for an example, let's go to the next slide. This, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this building, but it's the it's the community gym, the high school gym in Yale, which is in Guthrie County. It's over by Ogden and Jefferson. And a few years ago, um, the, the National Park Service added this building to its National Register of Historic Places. Um, I'm sure you are all familiar with the National Register. Iowa has 2,000 some sites on the National Register. And really, <clears throat> Um, often our job through the State Historical Preservation Office um, with the Department of Cultural Affairs, um, sometimes it's my job to um, draft a press release um, about a new addition to the National Register. So I work with um, a colleague and we um, dig up a little history about it and put it together into, into a press release. At first glance, I will tell you this is not an exciting story. At first glance, um, the idea that this old building was added to an official list of old buildings because some government officials decided that, that it that it was old enough and special enough to be added. Um, the action there, there's not a lot of action in that story. What happened was somebody applied and then a committee met in a room and decided they went over that application and they gave it their stamp of approval. That is not um, that's not an, a plot for a Hollywood action movie. It's not so exciting. However, if you dig a little bit under the surface and think about these news values, there are ways to make this, this story really compelling. So we dug up a little bit of the history and I'll just go down the list of factors there. In terms of magnitude, um, the idea that this, um, this ordinary building or this small town building in Yale is added to a national register. Okay, that's a little bit newsy. That doesn't happen every day. In terms of prominence, again, at first glance, it's not so exciting. However, in the history, um, we discovered that the, Har the Harlem Globetrotters um, played an exhibition game in this gym, which was kind of fun. Most people know who the Harlem Globetrotters are. So so we punched, we we emphasized that and we put it right up top in, in the top of the press release. And there were some great details about the Harlem Globetrotters. They were not used to playing in such a small gym and they weren't used to the, the round um, the round walls. So the home team had sort of an advantage because they knew how to like bounce off the round wall of the building um, or right, right off, off court. Uh, there wasn't a lot of conflict in this story, um, but we did play up a little bit. Yale, um, Yale, I forget who Yale High School's rivals were, um, but we just mentioned that, you know, just as a way to relate. Anybody who's gone to high school knows that any high school has a rival. So we talked about that a little bit, but we didn't really dwell on the conflict um, element. In terms of proximity, this was newsier. This was a more newsy story to people in Guthrie County and Western Iowa and Central Iowa than it would be to Davenport or Dubuque or Chicago. Um, but we did, so we pitched this story in Western Iowa, but also it got picked up in Des Moines because that was in striking distance. Um, in terms of timeliness, we released the press release probably a few weeks after the national um, register decision. So again, the timeliness on this story doesn't matter that much, but that is something to think about. A story is newsier if you, the story, if you release the story right, um, right when it's in the red hot moment. In terms of currency, we think about that in terms of what people are talking about, if it's sort of in the air, if it's current, if it's a current event. So I think we released this, this announcement in the summer. But we could have released it in the fall during basketball season um, just to give it a little more newsy punch. Uh, in terms of its uh, it being an unusual story, um, there are about 
Mm, I think there are a handful of round gyms in Iowa, so it's fairly unusual, and that's part of the reason it was added to the National Register. But then our trump card really is human spirit. So here's where we played up the nostalgia of this building. Um, we talked with people, um, uh, we found people who had played on basketball teams in this gym and remember um, both home and visiting team members, what they're, how it felt to play in this gym, gym. And in the story, we dropped in a few details about, um, oh, the smell of popcorn and the, the sounds from the crowd and the cheerleaders. So we also talked about generations. So um, fathers and, and especially in Iowa, mothers and daughters played basketball in this gym. And so it became a touchstone for this community, a touchstone for this community. And even if you've never been there, um, you can picture what it's like to be in a high, at a high school basketball game or in a gym. So we played up all of those factors as much as we could. And all together, that turned into a news story. So we sort of made it more compelling than it was at first glance when we thought, OK, it's been added to this national list. And it sounded very bureaucratic. So when you were thinking about projects, Think of ways that you can emphasize or sort of um, pump up some of those different news variables. You might not hit them all. You might not score a perfect 10 on each factor. But if there's certain ones that you can punch up, um, that is one way to get more people interested in the story you are telling. Let's move on to the next slide. When you are gathering, uh, when you're when you're putting together a story um, for step three, it's really important to find good sources. I imagine that most of you are professional advocates for your communities. You are you are being paid to say good things about your community, and fortunately, you're you're doing the work so that there are good things to say. But but often the stories you tell are more compelling and more credible and more authoritative if you have other people telling your story for you. The bonus of this is, as Iowans, most of us don't like to brag that much, but you can recruit other people to brag for you, and that's a great way to talk about your community in a way that doesn't make you sound like you're, you're tooting your own horn. So when you are gathering, uh, when you're finding sources um, and enlisting other people to help tell your story, Consider a few of these questions to find the best people um, to, to tell your story. For any community project or event, who initiated it? Who paid for it? Who made it happen? These are usually, these are the obvious people that we usually go to um, when we're telling a story. But if we go down the list, think about who volunteered to make it happen. These are the people who are hardcore. Um, these are the people who are giving their time and energy for your community project. Um, so they often have some great um, perspectives. Uh, there's a there's a there's a truck outside. I'm sorry if there's a little extra noise. Also, think about who benefits from your project or event, or who might benefit the most from it. Uh, maybe it's a, a business owner who moved into a, a, a renovated building. Maybe it's a school group that um, is participating in a festival and, and gets um, a highlight on their calendar. Or just think about who benefits from the project. Also, of all the people involved, expand your list a little bit and think about who is the youngest person who is involved. And if sometimes if you get an articulate kid, Kids, they they don't they don't know anything about spin. They don't know much about PR. So if you get a good kid, sometimes you have to interview several. But if you get a kid to talk about how he or she loves a building or loves a festival or or whatever the project is, they can be really compelling. Same thing on the other end of the spectrum. Um, if you think about older older residents in your community, they have perspective about how things have changed. And they can tell you, you know, boy, this sure looks different than it did 10 or 15 or 20 or 50 years ago. Sometimes their memories can be really persuasive and really compelling. As I'll, uh, always think about who represents a different perspective. Maybe it's a minority group or an immigrant. 
Um, maybe it's a maybe it's a new um, a newcomer to your community who has some fresh eyes. Um, think about who was originally skeptical about your project um, and maybe was won over. Um, and really, who might surprise you? Sometimes those people can help tell your stories and the quotes from them, people, um, your audiences will, um, they may give more weight to uh, a source like that rather than the mayor or a city councilor who, who are people we would expect to say good things about the project. I included this uh, snapshot of George Gallup in here just as a, a bonus trivia fact. He grew up in Jefferson and he's the guy who created the Gallup polls. So he knows all about um, finding good sources. Uh, you can visit his house in Jefferson. It's an octagonal house um, uh, near Jefferson Square. And, and there's a little museum where you can learn all about the George Gallup story. So I included him just for a little bit of Iowa inspiration. Let's go to the next slide. Here's an example about what I was talking about, about finding sources. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have seen the Papa John Sculpture Park in downtown Des Moines. It opened in 2009. Uh, and when I was the arts reporter for the Des Moines Register, um, we decided to publish a special section for this sculpture park. It was a big deal right in the middle of town. Lots of people were curious about it. Um, and so the week before the grand opening, um, we published a section to help people understand more about how the park came about and um, about some of the sculptures in the park. For me, it was the story I, I love telling because um, I got to learn a lot. I didn't know that much about sculpture beforehand. Um, and some of these sculptures were wild. They were just strange. And <laughs> to a lot of us, they seemed like, um, alien spaceships that just landed in downtown Des Moines and they were some of them looked strange and it was a great story from a reporter's perspective because everybody had opinions about all of them. Um, so in that special section, um, one of my favorite pages was just a, a, a collage of key players in the project and I asked each of them to help me fill out these four, those four topics right there, name, easy, the role, what the person's role was in the project. And then I asked them their favorite sculpture and their least favorite sculpture. As a reporter, I had the luxury of, um, it wasn't really my job to sugarcoat things. I was a neutral observer. So um, maybe if, um, if one of the one of the park's creators were publishing that, they might not ask a least favorite sculpture. But I would encourage you to um, be honest. And and when you are telling stories, it's OK to um, uh, include differing opinions. And it's OK if not everything is sunny and roses all the time, because it, it lends a little credibility to your story. You don't have to focus on that, but sometimes it's okay to say, you know, not everybody loves this, which is fine. But in terms of finding sources, so on that page of key players, obviously I talked to John and Mary Papa John, the donors um, who have had lived with a lot of these sculptures in their front and backyard. They live in a, in a neighborhood in Des Moines. And so some of the sculptures that they had spent years with looking at, at from their kitchen window are now downtown. So they had some interesting perspectives. I talked with the obvious, um, the usual suspects, the fundraisers, um, the director of the Des Moines Arts Center. I talked with the landscape architect who helped design some of the curved berms that divide the sculptures in different clusters. I talked with one of the city councilors who helped make it happen and the parks and rec director who um, had a hand in planning it. I loved talking with uh, the installation crews. These are the men and women whose job it is to move these multi-ton, multi-million dollar pieces of artwork and install them very, very carefully. They have specific opinions about which is their favorite sculpture and which is their least favorite sculpture. I remember I asked a hypothetical, um, I asked one of the installers if he was if he were designing a sculpture to drive an installation crew crazy, what would it look like? And he, he said, well, it would be really heavy and really fragile and it would have lots of multiple parts. And several years later, 
one of the sculptures looks exactly like that. <laughs> so his nightmare came true. But my favorite, by far, my favorite source for this story was the security guard. And he is not, um, he was not an obvious source, but of all the people <laughs> I talked with, he was the one who spent the most time thinking about the sculptures because every day um, and really every night, he paced the perimeter of the park while it was being built. And he had time to look hard at the sculptures and think about them. So he had some perspective that even, even the trained, even the Des Moines Art Center director, um, he just had a different viewpoint because he had spent time thinking about them. So again, he was a little bit off the, off the radar. He wasn't right in the middle of the project. He wasn't obvious. Um, but he had a really important role to play and a really uh, interesting perspective to add to the overall story. So let's go to the next slide. Once you've talked with your sources, once you've sort of gathered perspective from lots of different people, um, it's important to uh, just sketch out an outline. This often is one of my favorite steps in the story because I just like plotting how things fit together. Um, and I usually just sketch it out on a, a piece of notebook paper and it's it's kind of scribbly, but it makes sense to me. Um, and keep in mind that any story in any format, um, keep in mind that it's still a story. So the very, very basic ingredients of a story are characters and plot. So think about in the story that you're telling about your community project, think about who are the main characters and then what happened? Often, I suspect in your community stories, the beginning and middle and end will probably, it, here's one easy formula. Um, you start with what, what was in the before, what was the problem before the project? Then in the middle, you can talk about how the project developed, what happened during the process. And then at the end, um, what are the results that happened after the project? And again, if we if we go back to our sliding scale, if you project, um, if you look to the past, maybe five years ago or 10 years ago, or you project to the future so you can help people imagine what that will be, um, that may inform how you structure your story. But but basically, any story has a beginning, a middle and an end, even if the end hasn't happened yet. So sometimes. Sometimes you have to help people imagine what it will be. And you can gear your questions. Um, you can ask your sources, you know, what's the first thing you're going to do when you open up your shop in the new building? Or what's the first thing you're going to do um, when, when the new park opens? How, what will you do on that first day? And, and you can kind of get, have them imagine what it will look like. Um, to give your story an ending, even if it hasn't happened yet. Next slide. So here, this, this also goes back to Journalism 101. I don't know if any of you have taken journalism classes or, or written for um, newspapers, but this is very, this is old school stuff. Um, uh, the idea of an inverted pyramid, um, the basic idea, I don't know if you can see on your screen, <laughs> in the, the little print in the corner of the, uh, the sketchy one right by where it says fluff. It says this is a highly technical rendering of the inverted pyramid style of writing. So this is it in a nutshell. The idea behind this is that in the very in the lead in the first paragraph, you answer as many of the most important questions as you can. This is where you cram the answers to who, what, where, when, why and how. Um, and again, it's up to you decide to decide which of those um, which of those five W's uh, are most important. Um, but in a standard hard news story, you put all of the important stuff up top and then you slowly get more and more detail as you work your way down the pyramid. Again, on your screen, I don't know if you can see the tiny little, um, they're pink scissors um, on that striped pyramid. And that suggests that uh, this goes back to kind of the old days of a newspaper. Um, you wanted your most important stuff right up top because if an editor has to trim it for space, 
um, you don't want to bury some of your important stuff down at the bottom because if an editor cuts off the end of it, then people won't know important stuff. They call that burying the lead. Um, so you 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 top load um, the important stuff and then you kind of work your way down to medium sized details and then maybe you fold in a quote and then you get a you by the end of it you're deep into the weeds and it's sort of um nice to know stuff but not really need to know stuff at the bottom uh often if if you have gathered direct quotes from sources um i usually take my very best quote and put it up high Ooh. oh i'm back uh, I, M Michael, wave at me or or speak up if you cannot hear me. Uh, but the idea is, I usually if if I have some quotes, I usually um, lead with my um, I put my best quote up high, maybe in the third paragraph or so, um, and then my second best quote, I usually save that for the end as kind of a kicker, just to reward the people who um, read all the way to the bottom. Again, these are not hard and fast rules, um, but this is one way if you're staring at a blank computer screen and you got to put some words on the paper, this is one way to start that makes it a little bit easier. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so journalism professors, they can get carried away, but these are different outlines for news stories. Um, in addition to the inverted pyramid, you could choose the kebab or the martini glass. Um, which sort of um, combines the inverted pyramid and the kebab with the stem of the glass. Again, this is um, this is probably more technical than you need to know, but these are useful tried and true tried and true ways to outline a story. Uh, the in, the inverted pyramid that's usually used for hard news stories, so um, uh, crime and politics and. Um, maybe stories about the weather. It's kind of need to know stuff. When I was at the register and now at, at the Department of Cultural Affairs, a lot of the blogs I write or the features articles I write, I usually, um, if I were to analyze them, probably most of them follow the kebab outline where it starts with a really compelling anecdote. And then once, once you grab people's attention, then you move on to what's called the nut graph, which is really the paragraph. Graph is um, G R A F is news speak for a paragraph, um, and that's really the story in the in a nutshell. So this is often the hardest paragraph to write because you really want a good nut graph that encapsulates what your story is about. So your readers or your audience. Um, by the second or third paragraph, they know what this story is going to be about and they know um, whether they want to keep reading. So you, you grab their attention, you tell them what the story is about. Then I think on this diagram, there are three chunks of meat. There you get into a few more details and you string in some quotes. And then you kick it off or you, you um, cap it off with one more anecdote. And often this, uh, this kind of closes the loop a little bit and often this brings it back to the beginning. So if you quote somebody in that initial anecdote or you describe somebody in that initial anecdote, it, it is it is perfectly OK and it, it's often a good way to sum up the story by coming back to that person. When I wrote uh, um, when I wrote reviews of the Des Moines Symphony for the register, um, I knew that I was writing for um, a general public that included people with music degrees and uh, music experts, but I was also writing for readers who just happened to stumble in um, to the review. They just wandered in from the sports section. So I wanted to um, help all of the readers. Um, I wanted them to feel like they were at the concert because often with a with an article like that, a review, there are readers who are never going to go to a symphony concert and you know aren't going to buy tickets um, and have no, no intention to, but they're reading that story on its own sake. So I wanted, in that opening anecdote, I tried to give them enough details and a really vivid snapshot with lots of sensory images 
to help them imagine what it was like to sit in that sit in that concert hall seat and hear this music. So think about that when you are starting a story, think about what is the most vivid snapshot of the project. Maybe it was a turning point, maybe it was the applause at a ribbon cutting ceremony, um, maybe it was the first time that you saw blueprints or you, the first time that you saw a rendering for a future project. Um, think about what was the most vivid snapshot that 10 years and 10 years from now, this is the moment that you're going to remember um, in this story. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, here we go. Um, you 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 don't need me to tell you, but you've probably heard it from lots of lots of different places. Um, it is very, very important when you are st telling a story to have good images. Um, they make such a difference on helping people understand what you're talking about. Um, I saw it over and over again at the register. Um, whether a story had good images or not often helped decide where it would land in the paper. So um, kind of a kind of a less important or boring story with a really good image. OK, I'm back. I get a little um, something, a snag. Um, sometimes an, an image can help elevate a story. So um, sometimes there were at the register, there were really important stories and really exciting stories. But if there wasn't a great image for it, um, they would get kind of tucked inside. Um, and other stories that were less newsy or less compelling would land on the front page because they had a really good image. So think about, uh, I just jotted down a few basic requirements for photos. Okay, we're back. Sorry, sorry for those um, those drops. Um, just a couple points. Get good color photos. Um, make sure the photos are high enough resolution. Usually, um, that means if they're at least 300 dots per inch DPI, that makes them usable in most formats. Um, uh, one way, to, one easy way to tell is if you have an email attachment or if you save it to your computer. If the photo file takes up at least one megabyte of data, it's usually the resolution is usually good. Under that, and it it limits how how it limits where you can use that photo. Make sure your photos include people, if at all possible. Bonus points if you can see their faces. My own example kind of breaks that rule. Um, if you are sharing stories with other people, make sure that there's a caption so that um, people understand what's going on in the photo. And of course, um, include credit um, for who took the photo. This particular photo came from the Iowa Arts Council, so I will give them their due. Okay, next slide. Again, think about when you're telling stories, think about that that scale of time. If you are if you are time traveling or for your perspective, if you think about how today looks your community looks different than it did 10 or 15 or 20 or 100 years ago. Think about how you might use historic photos to tell your story. I can't tell you how many times we have used, the State Historical Society has used this photo of a women's suffrage parade in Boone um, because there are people there. You can almost put yourselves in the shoes of those marchers marching for women's voting rights. Um, and that that church is still there in Boone, so you can see you can see the passage of time, and that helps you. Um, whatever story you're telling, it it puts it in the context of the broader sweep of of your community's history. Next slide. Again, some of the story, stories you are telling, um, some of the chapters of that story haven't happened yet. So if you can get a rendering. Um, uh, people people are suckers for a good rendering. Um, I always like to see, um, I always look to see what's in the sky, because if you can just invent it, often there are, it's sunny and, you know, there are birds flying and it's, um, it's just a beautiful scene, which helps people imagine um, what that place might look like in the future. So um, if you've, if you've, I'm sure if you've participated in community development projects, you know how valuable a rendering is, um, they can help tell your story. Uh, next slide. 
So once you've once you've written your story, once you've kind of got it all out on paper, and even if it's not totally polished, even if even if it's not um, oh uh, you know completely uh, perfect, that's okay. Once you've written your story, one of the first things you're going to do is pull it apart so that you can take different chunks of it and post those different chunks on social media or make them available in newsletters. When I talked about that nut graph, what is your story in a nutshell? Often that one paragraph is something that you can drop into your own newsletters or send to other organizations for their newsletters. There are so many people writing that need content for monthly newsletters. If you can help them write their newsletters, um, that's, a, that's a great thing to do. Same thing for blogs and media kits and websites. So think about different ways that you can slice and dice your story um, into different formats. Um, going back to the example from the Papa John Sculpture Park and those interviews of all of those different key players, each one of those little mini interviews with those key players, each one of those could be a social post, or you could drop one into monthly newsletters for a whole year. And so there are different ways that you can get the most out of your content. Once you have a good story, you can figure out different ways um, to, to use it. Next slide. And again, the final step here, spread the word. Um, uh, I, I want to give a shout out to Lansing. Um, we posted this, the, the film office, Produce Iowa, posted this on social media a couple of weeks ago, and Lansing was on it. There are lots of people who are fans of Lansing. Um, but what we did um, for this post, we were encouraging people, Produce Iowa, the film office, has a, a database where property owners can, um, for free, they can list their properties with a photo um, and sort of entice film and TV producers to come film a movie or TV uh, show or an advertisement um, in their town or on their property. Um, it's just a way, it's, it's a great way to draw a business. So I would encourage all of you to check out the Produce Iowa locations database and make sure that there are some photos of your community in there because you never know. Um, you never know which, um, who's the next um, Steven Spielberg who might want, um, might want to tell a story in a town that looks just like yours. So um, we, we constantly bang that drum on social media and encourage communities and property owners to list their Iowa properties. Um, but Lansing, Lansing did a great job. They added some photos on that database. And again, the photos caught people's attention in the busy, in the busy carnival of social media. Um, and so many, so many um, businesses uh, in Lansing shared this with their people. So I think at last count, this had been shared or it had reached 9,000 people or something, which I don't know, is probably <laughs> 10 times the population of Lansing. Um, so encourage people to tell your story and spread the word. The other bonus, if other people are telling your story, you can learn about that story from them because they will tell it in a different way. They might focus on different things that are important to them. So it's valuable for you to hear other people telling your story because you can pick up new things. Uh, next slide, I think. Uh, yeah, this is the last one. Um, <clears throat> I, I included this just as kind of an end cap. If we go back to President Polk, who said that nothing much happened, um, there, there have been Iowans throughout the decades who have disagreed. Um, in the 1880s, uh, well, in the, in the back half of the 19th century, a lot of the communities that were settled across Iowa were settled by immigrants, um, many from the Scandinavian countries and Germany and then um, the, around the Mediterranean too. Um, but some of the, especially the Scandinavian communities like Story City and Decorah and um, uh, some of the others, they, um, they published pamphlets and brochures in their native language and sent it back to the old world to, in, to encourage their friends and neighbors from back, back home to come and settle in Iowa. So these were really um, promoting their towns. Um, and we have some of these um, pamphlets in at the State Historical Society and they are fascinating. Um, but I bring this up, especially, <clears throat> especially um, I wanted to just call out the Decora Posten, which was a Norwegian news, it was a Norwegian language 
newspaper published in Decora. And at its peak, it had almost 50,000 subscribers, um, both in Iowa and in Norway. And at the State Historical Society in the archives, you can see shelves and shelves and shelves of old newspapers. Um, we've received several grants from the Library of Congress to digitize them and share them. Um, so we have hundreds of newspaper titles from all across Iowa that we are we have preserved and are, are telling those stories. But I bring it up because what the stories you tell now, um, they may not seem like a big deal to you now, but over time, they tell the history of your community. So there are things that were every day in 1900 or 1930 um, that might not have seemed like a big deal at the time, but looking back, you can see turning points and you can see how some of the stories weave together. You can see how some of the characters um, interact in different ways. So I just encourage you to think about um, the, the value of the stories that you are telling now and how they will stack up for posterity and how people will benefit from the stories you tell. The Decora post in um, here, the, there's a story that they tell in Decora that <clears throat> there was an, an immigrant from Norway who subscribed to the Decora post in. So he was in Norway and he received um, all of, he received the Decora newspaper written in Norwegian and it it told all of these great stories about Decora, and so he finally decided, okay, if it's so great, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna immigrate, um, and I'm gonna resettle in Decora. And this, as the story goes, he was sailing into New York Harbor on a, on the big immigrant ship, and as it was passing, uh, as the ship passed the Statue of Liberty, he sort of elbowed his friend and he said, "Whoa, if this is New York City, just imagine, just imagine what Decora looks like." <laughs> So obviously he had heard all of these great things. So I will I will cap it off there, but I really encourage you to um, understand the value of the stories you are telling now and how they can add up uh, cumulatively, um, not just now, but for um, the next few years or the next decades or the next generations. And I just encourage you to keep up the good work, um, the work you're doing and also the stories you are telling about the work. So I think we have some time for questions. I kind of zip through that. Um, but I don't, I don't, Michael, yeah, I don't know absolutely. if no. there are no, comments you. or however, absolutely. however you want to ask questions, fire away. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Michael. And, and yeah, let's transition right into um, some of the questions that you may have. Um, and, and, and while you're thinking, I just want to bring up a couple things that really stood out to me. Um, while everyone's thinking about um, questions that they may have is it goes back to that, uh, the, the Yale story, uh, the Yale High School gym. And I think, you know, the National Register is something that is important to the work of of all of us here at Main Street, Iowa. So many of our communities are either National Register districts or or have individually listed properties. And and I can really appreciate the fact that if if any of us saw a story in the, in, in the register or any sort of newspaper that said, this building was listed on the National Register. Most of us would probably turn the page. Um, and I think that relates to a lot of the work that we do um, with Main Street programs is, is a lot of the work we do is behind the scenes. A lot of the work we do is so important to the foundation of our organizations. But if you tried to put it on the on the front page of a blog or something, people would probably go ho-hum. So I really appreciated those newsy elements that you, de you described of how you could pull out one or two nuggets to really take that story that could be perceived as ho-hum and, and really make it something that uh, people want to share with their parents or share with their friends. So, so that was the first one that stood out. The second one is that security guard anecdote. To me, I think that is um, so relative to, to what we do because you know, not many of us would think about talking to, in your in your example, the security guard, but it's that that bystander that is an important element to the project that is just outside of our our, our, our vision, if you will. So I, I really appreciated that. Um, the other thing that stood out to me was the, uh, the kebab, um, the kebab metaphor. And I think that one really comes down to when, when we're thinking about, you know, these smaller chunk stories that we're going to be telling through the Main Street Awards is that, is that idea of how do we take what could be a large project and break it into small chunks to, uh, to walk through um, from that perspective. And then the last one is the monkey bread um, image. I, I love monkey bread, but the idea of pulling it apart is is just a great image to say, you know, we're going to be doing it for this, you know, the, the Main Street stories. 
Um, but I think your example, Michael, gave a really good, um, really good framework for us to say, okay, we're going to submit this to the Main Street Iowa Awards submissions uh, this year. But what are four other ways that we could use that story? And that's something that I would challenge all of us to think about um, from that side. Uh, Michael, any thoughts before I turn it to the group to? Uh... Yeah, I'm glad you reminded me about that monkey bread. I'm a, I'm a fan too. That's partly why I chose that image. But Keep in mind that there are some, depending on your audiences, whether they're locals or out of towners, some people will want to eat the whole pan of monkey <laughs> bread and they will want to know every single detail. They're gonna gobble up everything that you put on the table. But some people will just want to nibble. They'll just want a bite of that monkey bread. I I don't know, I can't imagine who those people are. I'm <laughs> I'm sort of a whole cake person. But think about that in, in the way that you package your stories. A lot of times um, it's useful if you have a blog or a website, it's useful to have a spot where you can you can go deep and you can tell the whole story and you can have the whole cake. But then there are lots of different places on social media or in newsletters where you give them just a little bite and then a link to the whole story. So that way people can kind of, um, they can kind of uh, consume as much of the story as they want. So, so think about that too. There are people who want to eat the whole cake, um, but most people are probably nibblers. Excellent. Um, this would be a great time if you have any questions or any aha moments that you pulled out from uh, from today's conversations. And I'd encourage you, invite you to unmute and and even turn your camera on so we could we could see who's talking. Hey, Michael. There's a couple of questions in chat. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, Abby uh, is asking, what is an example of a good attention grabber? Um, I think here, um, I've, by now I've written hundreds of stories. Um, I always look for something that's surprising. Um, if, if, especially if you're talking about a, a community project and if it's coming from the Main Street Iowa office or if it's coming from your local Main Street office, people expect people expect somebody to say something nice about the community project, right? If there's even a little bit of a surprise there where a quote is, I don't know, from some from some local, I don't know, some local grouch who was like, Eesh, I never thought this was gonna get completed or whatever. But then very quickly you say, but if that person also says, you know, but I was happily surprised or um, I think if, there, if there's something that's a little bit counterintuitive that that grabs people's attention. Otherwise, another way to just grab people's attention. Think about your five senses. If if those first couple sentences can um, if they can be very specifically visual or you can describe the sound of something or the feel of something, or even, who knows, even the smell of something, often a, a good way to grab people's attention is if they can imagine being there. So when you're, when you're thinking about how to organize your story, really focus on your five senses and think about what is the most sensory way that you can lead into a story. Uh, I th oh, here, um, from Deb, I understand. Oh, yes, I can. I will. Michael has a copy of the PowerPoint and he can distribute it. Excellent. No, Thank you. Susan Thank already you, answered that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Are there other questions here I'm missing? Hey, Michael. Yeah. I had to chime in too with one of the things I know that um, directors are faced with is ways that volunteers can um, get recognition and be involved. And one of the things that you mentioned was that um, the main characters, who are the main characters? And, you know, that's a great way to um, let your volunteers shine by quoting them or having them part of the story. Uh, so just want to point that out to our, our team too and, and our network that uh, don't forget to use those volunteers too. Especially when you're talking with volunteers or anybody who contributes to a project, um, two of my all-purpose handiest questions are, what was the hardest part and what was your favorite step in the process? Those usually give you some something to work with. What was the biggest challenge and then what what, what did you like most in this whole process? 
Excellent. Well, Michael, thank you again so much for, for your insights and your ideas and your perspective coming from the professional side of journalism, but really taking it down to um, you know the, the layperson's uh, you know journalism that we that we got here from the 101 perspective and 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 what I take away as well is you know as we relate to uh, the stories that that our network is going to be sharing whether that be through their 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 traditional uh, storytelling you know the the blogs and the the newspaper articles and the the social media or it's the the main street story submissions I, one of the things i took away is that you know you, you could start small you could start to chunk it out and it's the idea that it's it's if you if you at least tell some of the information you're telling the story but if we don't you know that idea from that decora um, story is if those stories weren't told that that outside wouldn't have gotten any of that information they wouldn't have been pulled there so as we think about the the main street awards um, the 2021 main street awards submissions um, this year don't feel like you have to write a professional story that's polished and that's cleaned up and it's it's ready for prime time really what we're hope to do is take some of these elements take the insights that michael is, is passed on and, and work them into your process to gather those stories identify those stories and and tell the information um if you want to work in and and put you know identify all of the the elements of a of a, of a quote unquote good story and, and package that that's great um, but if you don't feel comfortable doing that Grab some, grab some bulleted information, grab those elements that could be the, the outline of a story and make sure you're submitting that. Um, most importantly, I, I, I and, and Main Street Iowa doesn't want anyone to be intimidated by the idea that we're going to be submitting stories for uh, this year's awards, um, the, the storytelling focus of our awards. Um, so really wanna just encourage everyone to dive in with both feet and really take um, uh, some, just become ex get excited about it. I think that's that's the end that I want to to uh, to kind of wrap that up. Um, but just as a let oh, me, go ahead, Michael. Um, yeah, let, let me just piggyback off that point. Um, there is a distinction between reporting and writing, um, and anybody who works in the news has both skills. And some people are great reporters, and some people are great writers. Um, but it, to Michael's point, if you can. If you can be a reporter, if you can gather the stuff, if you can recognize what might be interesting um, and and recognize the elements of a story and recognize um, good photos or good images, if you can gather all of the ingredients um, and report it, that's you're you're almost you're almost all the way there. And then once you have the good ingredients, a good writer can kind of stitch them together. So because you are close to these projects, because you have access that maybe nobody else has, you are in a good spot to re report the stories and gather up all those ingredients. So um, don't worry if it if it's not a totally polished narrative at the end. Get the goods first. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. That is a absolutely perfect way uh, to encapsulate uh, today's conversation. And you, just as a, a quick reminder, the awards uh, submission, the story submission deadline for the Main Street Iowa Awards this year is February 19th. Uh, so we're quickly coming up on a month out. It's hard to believe we're, we're there already. Um, and we will be planning some sort of event uh, on May 14th to celebrate uh, together and separately um, on, on how that will look. We don't exactly know right now, but that will be developed just like everything else on uh, we'll we'll be flying that ship while we're uh, we're uh, we'll be flying it while we build it. Um, I encourage everyone to to really spend some time, you know, try to block out an hour in the next few days, and really think about how you could start to identify one of those stories and start to get, like Michael just said, start to get pull the, that reporter type meat information uh, down. But really think about how in the near future you could you could. Uh, really commit to some time while this information is fresh. And I think once we get one of those stories down, it'll be an, it'll be an inspiration for the next two or three that you would like to, to submit from Main Street Iowa. As you jump in, do not hesitate to reach out to anyone at the Main Street Iowa team uh, to help guide or to help um, you know identify some sources or just brainstorm some ideas. We'd be more than happy to do those uh, those types of activities. But most importantly, we look forward to hearing the stories and telling the stories as we get into 2021. So we were are just over two o'clock. Michael, 
thank you again for being here today. And most importantly, thank you for all the work that you're doing with the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, to help tell the story of Iowa. It's an important element of, of what we do and, and what you're doing. Um, and to, to put one more plug in, 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 if you have any stories, send them to us, but also send them to Michael because Michael has the ability to, to piece them together with a lot of other uh, blocks to the quilt, if you will, of, of what Iowa is doing. So Michael, thank you. Everyone else, thank, thank you. you for being here today. We uh, look forward to seeing you at a future training. Um, if you haven't already, make sure that you're paying attention some of, to some of the upcoming trainings uh, that are related to the, uh, the updated information on the PPP program. Uh, we'll be doing a handful of those over the next week dedicated towards you as a nonprofit, um, local businesses that you could support, as well as that targeted program uh, for vacant, uh, for um, for impacted um, music venues and, and theater venues. So we look forward to seeing you um, at a future conversation and most importantly, have a wonderful Wednesday. So thank you so much and have a good day, guys.